Bueno, Miguel Cruña. So Miguel Cruña is not your real name. Is my uh, nom de plume. My real name is Miguel Rodriguez, but every time someone uh, needed to look for me in social media and look for Miguel Rodriguez, imagine how many Miguel Rodriguez showed up, no? So I was feeling so frustrated, uh, telling everyone, no, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that I decided just to change my name, make it easy, and pay a little bit of a tribute to Coruña, which is my hometown. So from then on, Miguel Coruña everywhere. Which is the link that we share, because that was where I was living in, in Galicia. So we're both... Nenos from Coruña. Coruña, see. Sí. Yeah. <laughs> Nenos, whatever. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So why wine? How did you get into this world of wine? So I've been linked with the world of wine uh, due to my grandfather. He used to he used to actually be a wine merchant in, in Coruña. He used to run Bodegas Alonso. So mm. I basically grew up uh, in a family where wine consumption was very normalized. And where you could see, you know, very traditional wines. My grandfather was a man that even when we needed to go to buy wine ourselves, he used to give us a little bit more money just to buy quality wine, you know, because he knew all the chemicals and all the bad things that people used to put in, in cheap wine. Yeah, for sure. And so then how does a Neno from, from Coruña uh, wind up in Edinburgh in Scotland? How does that happen? So, so I actually end up in Scotland because I, I was doing a completely different thing. I studied uh, advertisement and public relations, and I was working for La Sexta as an intern uh, back in the days. And it got me the time when La Sexta merged with Antena Tres. And the people there told me, look, if you want to keep your job, you need to learn English. Edinburgh look like a perfect match. You know, we have the Galician weather all over. Right. Gray, green, rainy. And the logical step for me to start looking for a job was hospitality. And I ended up in a Michelin star restaurant uh, where I've been lucky enough to be exposed to people with great passion for wine. And since then on, I completely forgot about the other side. I left the public relations and advertisement on the side and start focusing on wine. Um, what are you doing right now? What projects do you have right now related to Galician wine? So at the moment, I'm running my own company. It's called Fion. So I've been living now 12 years in Scotland. So the Galician link wasn't always like that because I train a lot with classical wines. And then I've been working in an Italian uh, wine bar. But when I started to improve my wine knowledge and to start becoming more aware of the quality of the wines I like, I decided it was time, you know, to promote the quality of the wines that we have in, in here. So when I finally managed to settle my, my company with my partner, Vera, we decided that Galicia would have a lot of weight in the, in the offer of the wines that we do. So we have an online shop where you can find a lot of Galician wines. We constantly do pop-ups and events talking about uh, Galician wines and other Atlantic wines. So we are basically <laughs> breaking everyone's balls, if I can say this bad expression, <laughs> uh, just to try to, you know, spread the gospel and, yeah. and make people realize that Galician wines are perfect fit also for Scottish gastronomy as well, you know? A lot of people talk about, uh, you see Albarino and Tesco, right? So that's yeah. kind of the quality that we're seeing, the level of volume that's being produced. Do you think that people seek out higher quality artisan wines from Galicia as well in Scotland? You have two very different type of consumers. Until now, you know, now we are starting to produce here as well uh, some decent quality wines, both sparkling and still, but not until that long ago, uh, UK depend depended on importing wine from all over the world. People that like wine tend to be quite an educated a customer. Yes, you know, it's very difficult to take them away from their classic Italy or classic friends, but they do also dis like to discover wines. Mm. So more artisanal wines goes uh, much better with this profile of, you know, educated wine consumer. But then you have the day-to-day -day consumer that normally is oriented by the price point of a bottle of wine when they go to the supermarket wines, you know. 
and that's some educational task that we have on our shoulders, you know, because when you go to Tesco, for example, or Sainsbury, and you take a bottle of wine, you see these weird labels. What is this? El Camarón Albariño, el, el Pulpo Albariño. And you turn them around and you see that actually that bottle of wine hasn't been made by a winery. Yeah. And people don't really care about that. But even Spaniards living here, eh? But some people would say that that's a market niche itself, right? The the idea of value wine, that we need people to enter at some point and say, oh, I like Albarino. And then maybe once they educate themselves with things like what you're doing, they can say, oh, well, now I want to drink Rodri Mendez or Do Ferreiro or Shusho Alba or whatever. No, I do agree. I do agree. I don't deny the fact that the denominations and big brands actually did all the dirty job, especially because they are the ones that have the capability of invest money on marketing in the supermarkets. And that's the very first, you know, barrier to knock down, which is people looking into a label of Alvarino or Trechadura and saying like, oh, what is this? Let me try it. And then if they like it from then on to move on. What cannot happen is that all the efforts uh, in terms of communication and marketing only goes towards that side. Because talking about the UK market, I think that Galician wines are a really well-established reality, you know, because you can see them in all the supermarkets in all the big uh, volume retailers, but also in the best wine lists in the country. You know, there's a lot of Galicia, and it's not only Rias Baixas, but you can start seeing Monterrey, you can see Ribeira Sacra, you can see... So is the time to open a second way, which is like, okay, obviously there's people that still need to do the dirty work because that's going to be beneficial, but we need to realize that the quality of a region is just sustained by a 10% of wines or even less which is more the artisanal terroir driven uh, labels that are out there you know especially if we want to become and establish ourselves like one of the classic regions of tomorrow so you uh, are part of an initiative or you began an initiative recently right called grupo riche and yes that's something operating out of galicia with galicia and wine professionals sommeliers Explain a little bit, what is Grupo Orishe and what is the mission? So Grupo Orishe is an agrupation or an association of, of individuals born uh, out of a frustration, if we can call it like that, because we saw what we've just been talking about, you know, that the denominations of origin only push a certain way of message. So as a reaction to that, we decided to create this cultural. We are a cultural group. We don't want to be anything bureaucratic, we don't want to start like a, a war. But from the places where we work, from our pulpits, we want to start communicating Galicia in a different way. Okay, and one of the it, things that you're pushing for, right, is more zonification of Galicia. Yes. How do you define it? So Galicia needs a zonification because otherwise we are going to eradicate all of our viticultural history. You know, you, you can see that basically now all the communicative messages are Ribeiro equals Treixadura. You know, for me, Ribeiro is a more complex reality, which is all about uh, that viticultural polygamy, you know, with many varieties co-planted yeah. together. It's all about minifundia, small holdings. Rias Baixas is not only Alvarino, but it's, we cannot forget that Espadeiro, Caíño were also very important grey varieties, even more than, than Alvarino itself. So for us, as we see that sonification is possible, because we have the, the big components, which are mostly minifundia, you know, we have really old vineyards. We have those vineyards that remain normally are in historical places that you can easily trace. We can study the soils and many people already study the soils. So it's like, why are we being so lazy that we are not putting this together? I mean, look, Bierto, look, Priorat, they've done it. It's difficult. It will take a lot of time, but why is not happening? So from Group Orishe, we don't want to invent anything new. We want to work and we will start interviewing uh, winemakers just to work hand in hand with them, just to be able to communicate wines and classify them according to a pyramid that will classify the wines into municipalities like concellos, parishes, because they are also realities that are there. And then single vineyards or historical single vineyards. We obviously establish some criteria to define what a single vineyard is. History, exposition, quality of the soil, age of the vineyard will be important for us to be able to say like this is a historical vineyard or this is a single vineyard, you know. Nowadays there are there are a lot of wineries 
that are labeled in single vineyards, but those single vineyards are in plots of land which were not suitable for growing vines, you know, because there were very fertile soils where you planted right. Potato, other kinds corn of or whatever. Yeah, hey, exactly. Some people might push back and say Galicia is right. a very young wine growing region in the modern sense, right? How do you kind of balance between the idea of historical vineyards and classifications and the DO system that really has only existed for 45 years. If we were pushing bureaucratically, that would have been a mess, you know, because that obviously needs proper study, taking uh, geologists to study the soils, to actually, you know, uh, certify the age of the vineyards and, and all these parameters. But in a communicative way, uh, it's just based on, on trust. Because, for example, even a region like the, the Barbanza, they have like even vines that are still in Pie Franco that are 200 years old. Even if in the label they will, wouldn't classify that or specify it, I think we feel a duty, you know, that that we need to start telling this to the world. So it's because the, what you're doing then is a storytelling initiative more so than a than a bureaucratic initiative. Exactly. Are you open to working with the DOs? I think I'm a very objective guy. So I like to tell the things that are been doing right or have been done in a good way. But if there's something I don't like, I will speak up as well. And for example, I did, a, and I ran a, a wine tasting here for the Orias Baixas ones. When you get the list that they send you to be, you know, just to see which winemakers or which wineries can you work with, there's no artisan wineries there. It makes you think like, why are you not interested to show or to give access to the people that are going to be running tastings to showcase the people that actually are sustaining the quality of your region on the shoulders and that could even open uh, your wines to a next level of market which is investment wines you know because galicia is in the position where we can be competing against the great classical regions and we are already are without any kind of embarrassment and believe me galicians we are very famous for self-embarrassment <laughs> yeah of course right so let me ask you what is your utopian vision 20, 25, 30 <laughs> years in the future for Galicia. Where should Galicia be? Where Where do you want to see Galicia end up? Okay, that's a good one. So I still vision uh, the big wineries, of course. I'm not denying that they, they, we need those because, as I said, they do the dirty job. So the, we still need those supermarket and wines. But I would love to see Galicia and I think we will achieve it if we push in the right direction of sonification our vineyards towards competing face to face with Burgundy. So I think, for example, the the message that we want to send is that we need to be flexible from the organizations. You know, is there's room for a, we are stuck in the past. The regulations that we had in the denominations of origins at the moment they are back in the nineties. And those regulations did actually make sense back then because in that time we were starting to learn the technique to make good wines. But now we are in a time where we already know the technique and the new generations are coming strong, pushing towards show that terroir-driven wines can be done. Now we need to broaden our regulations to be more inclusive with those wines you know people that are experimenting doing rosés for example or bubbles or orange wines or sonifying yeah. you know we need to start considering all of these parameters because otherwise we are going to be stuck in the past and yeah. we are not going through so what do the dos need to do to move into the future besides zonification to effectively promote all the wines. Yeah, includes them. Here in the UK, as I said, when you run a tasting to help these uh, denominations to spread the word, you don't see the small one. You maximum see a medium-sized winery. And there are wineries that are doing an amazing job. We need to start including those people, you know, because the, as, as we said before, there's room for everyone. You can put in your tasting when it's like Martin Codas, Mar de Frades and stuff. But then bring on the table people like Shurcio that you interviewed the other day and also where I'm in the vineyard at the moment. <laughs> and Rodri and Chicho and all these people. 
you know, eulogio. Why don't we see those wines in the tastings? Okay, so last thing we're going to do is the lightning round, okay? Oh, Here we go. Three, two, one. Describe Galicia in three words. Paparota, eating fish, choiva, because we cannot deny that we are sons of the rain. And because I live far away from Galicia, Morriña. A wine that changed your life. I have it clear is Gorbia, 2015, Quinta da Muradella, because that's when I realized about how much potential Galician wines have. A Galician wine that you love right now. Uh, Pedra Neira by Eulogio Pomare. Uh, it's just so different to the other cubes he does. Beautiful. Favorite word in Galician? I'm going to say enchebre, typical Galician, yes. Why should people know Galician wine? Because we have the potential to become the classical region of the world. And Galicia is just not Galicia. Galicia is the sum up of many other sub-regions where every corner is a different terroir and every single one of them needs to be explored because there's so much complexity, so much variety if you miss out you're losing man <laughs> there you go you heard it here first okay miguel cruña thank you so much for talking to me absolutely pleasure noah thank you for your time a lot viva galicia viva galicia carajo <laughs> carajo muy bien